civilian, but I've come here this afternoon to talk to you about war. It's very hard to keep in mind as we're sitting here today that as we speak, there's a war raging in the mountains of, of Afghanistan and continuing in the deserts of Iraq. This war is one in which 1,700,000 men and women will have participated. It is a war in which more men and women have survived with serious physical injuries than in any other conflict in the history of our country, a ratio of eight to one. But it's also a war where we have finally discovered and understood more deeply the meaning of the invisible wounds that people suffer from combat exposure. It's estimated right now that between 10% and as many as 30% of the veterans who will be coming home to their families and to their communities will be suffering from some form of combat stress reaction. This includes post-traumatic stress disorder, but also severe depression and chronic anxiety. It's the kind of suffering that can last for a lifetime, because even now, veterans of World War II in VA hospitals are for the first time revealing their trauma, their suffering, to social workers and psychologists who are there to listen. So these are treatable wounds, the invisible wounds of war. But the tragedy is that we estimate more than half of all those who will be afflicted will not receive any treatment. And why is that? Well, among the major reasons is that there simply aren't enough social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists available, either in the civilian population or in the armed forces. But even more importantly, for those who are available, they have not been appropriately trained to understand the effects of combat exposure, of psychological trauma, and of military culture. So the question is, what can we do? The School of Social Work and the Institute for Creative Technologies have combined to provide a revolutionary new approach to training of graduates in the mental health professions and the retraining of practitioners who are out in the field today. What we are attempting to do is to harness the power of avatars and a virtual reality environment so that students can become deeply immersed in a controlled and directed experience of interaction with individuals who've received, uh, in a virtual environment, individuals who've received uh, effects from combat stress exposure. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Skip Rizzo, who will give you some sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Skip. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, today, I'm going to describe and demonstrate some of the advanced technology applications that we've created to address these wounds of war, these invisible wounds of war that Marilyn has described. And this is done through our collaboration between the University of Southern California School of Social Work and the Institute for Creative Technologies. Um, now, I think we need some sound on this. So. Now, if you're... Um, not familiar with the Institute for Creative Technologies. We're a USC research institute, um, but we're sort of like the unholy alliance between Hollywood, the military, and academia. Um, three totally different cultures that somehow you throw them all together in one building and you get a range of expertise that leads to the creation of multimedia, 
and virtual reality applications that have been used for testing, training, and treatment. Our lab, the VR Psych Lab, over the years has been developing applications using virtual reality to address psychological disorders, cognitive and motor impairments in clinical populations, and more recently we've been developing applications for um, virtual patients that allow clinical professionals to interact with a virtual patient before they actually see real patients, that way they can mess up with a digital patient before they mess up with a real patient. Um, the real challenge now with our conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan um, is apparent. We have a very significant mental health problem on our hands and it's our duty to do our best to take care of these folks when they come back. It's been documented by many uh, individuals in terms of active duty populations, veteran populations, and in a recent RAND report, approximately 300,000 people are expected to suffer the symptoms of PTSD and major depression. So we do have a significant mental health problem on our hands. And the collaboration with the School of Social Work is gonna be vital in addressing some of those problems with the particular challenges being developing better evidence-based treatments, training clinical care providers to be able to deliver those treatments effectively, and then breaking down barriers to care so that soldiers or family members that are hesitant to seek treatment because of stigma and other reasons can find help um, in a way that is easy for them and can help them move along in the care process. Now, with the uh, School of Social Work now, we're doing a number of applications with virtual reality for PTSD, which I'll demonstrate in a minute. Um, we've developed virtual patients for training clinical care providers, and we have a project um, with an online guide that helps guide people through the healthcare process to encourage them to seek treatment with a live provider. Now, what I'm going to demonstrate now um, is virtual Iraq. Now this is a system that we've developed and my colleague Brad Newman, the technical lead on the project, is serving the role of a patient here. Um, this works off of the concept of exposure therapy and traditionally it's been done in imagination with the therapist guiding the patient through, in a very graduated fashion, uh, the events that traumatized them when they were in conflict. Um, you do it in a very safe, slow, progressive fashion and eventually the patient is encouraged to process the emotional memories that have been traumatizing them. Problem with that is that a lot of times we don't know what's going on in the hidden world of imagination. Um, some patients have a problem with engaging in the trauma memories to effectively process them. So we built a simulation where we can put a person in the visuals of the environment, this being 24 block city um, modeled after something you'd see in, Af in Iraq or Afghanistan. And we can systematically deliver stimuli in the environment to pace the patient's exposure, gradually reaching to the level where they've faced some of the things that they've feared the most. Um, so with that, I'm going to demonstrate some things here. The clinician has a control panel in which in real time they can change the nature of the environment, they can change the time of day, the weather conditions, uh, make it night. Let's brighten that up a little bit so everybody can see it. Um, morning light, we can click a button, make it night vision. Uh, the characters in the scene can be eliminated, so it's an empty city. We can turn on some ambient city sounds or just the sound of wind, add in a prayer call. Let's bring these folks back into the scene. Um, and as Brad walks through the environment, uh, we can make things happen. Like we can introduce um, a dog barking or an RPG. Now, if that's too much for the patient, we can begin to move them to other areas, a safe area in the north of the city, a safe area in the south of the city, um, a dirt field in the middle. Um, we can gradually pace the exposure at a level that the patient can handle. Um, I'm going to move him to a more provocative environment now. So he's in the east end of the city, um, looking around, and he's going to approach a group of Iraqi civilians hanging out. Let's get rid of that RPG in the distance. And then we can make something very traumatic happen. And uh, 
this would be the high end of the exposure scale. But as patients go through this, we can deliver a variety of things that are, that are paced to the level of trauma that they've experienced and help them to process emotional memories. Um, introducing gunfire and so forth, a variety of things that we can put in, the, in this world. So the key element here is that we can do this at a safe rate and also the idea that uh, we don't push people beyond what they're capable of. Thus far, this is at about 44 different sites um, and the clinical outcome data indicates that uh, if people complete the 10 sessions of exposure therapy, 75% no longer meet PTSD criteria at the end of treatment. Now with that said, I'm gonna move on to the next area and that is the virtual human work. Now the Institute for Creative Technology has developed virtual humans over the years to address military needs for cultural sensitivity, interacting with various characters, negotiation training, leadership training. Um, and this has driven our work to develop virtual patients. So we have a, a clinical office. And in one of our early applications, working with the, the uh, Department of Psychiatry, we built a sexual assault patient. And I'd like to uh, show a video clip of a psychiatry resident interacting with this patient. Very difficult clinical challenge in uh, doing a diagnostic interview. Hello, my name is Dr. Davis. Uh, is... Hello. Uh, what, uh, what brings you into the office today? Something bad happened that night. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, can you tell me what happened? I was in the car with Eddie and he stopped the car and wanted me to kiss him, but when I tried to stop him, he threatened me with a knife. Now these virtual humans can have different levels of artificial intelligence and the ability to have natural language processing so that you, it has basically voice recognition. So you can conduct a clinical interview in this fashion. We'll let them ask one or two more questions and move on. This has been very tough for you. Yeah, it still is. Do you find yourself uh, still being bothered by what happened? Whenever thoughts of the event pop into my head, I put my iPod on real loud. Uh, you mentioned thoughts pop into your head. What, what kind of thoughts pop into your head? I want to get away. Okay, so um, from this early work, we've gone on and created military versions of these characters and expanded the work with the School of Social Work. And now, recently, we actually have a full-scale demo where you actually sit in a room with a projection, a little bit more realistic, but we can also do it on a laptop so you can practice your clinical skills in your dorm room if needed. Um, we'll have a demo of this at the TEDx um, uh, demo site tonight, and these are just what some of our new patients look like a little bit more real. Finally, the last project, just one slide on this, and this is taking the same virtual human uh, technology and building online virtual guides that people that are hesitant to seek help with real providers can go online. It's not a doc in a box, but they can ask questions, they can get answers, they can get guided to healthcare information, and hopefully take the next step after putting a toe in the water um, towards seeking the care they need. So, thank you.